Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another edition of Prometheus University. Today we'll be talking about elastic curvature of beams. And it is the third part in our nine part series on bending stress analysis and design. So let's get right into it. In our previous lectures, we talked about what bending is, the stresses it produces. We came up with the section modulus, which is a cross-sectional property. We also came up in the next lecture, which is our second lecture, with the moment of inertia and talked about how all that has to do with the stresses that are and the stress distribution in a cross section, in a particular cross section. But now we're going to talk about the beam itself and how it changes shape and how it deforms and actual measurements that we can make and predictions that we can make about these measurements. So if we have a beam and we load it with a force P perpendicular to its length, it will deform in this shape. Granted, this is exaggerated, but let's consider that this is how it deforms magnified. Now, question is, how can we measure this change in shape from the blue to the red beam? Well, we can talk about a few things. So it has a moment in it which causes it to create this shape. And if we consider point A and point B, we can talk about a vertical change, which has to do with its original position as the blue beam and then a vertical drift downwards to the red beam. We can call that the delta. So we have delta A and delta B at point, points A and point B. We can also talk about the rotation a rotation measured from the horizontal to its new tangential uh, line. So we have a rotation theta A at point A and a rotation theta B at point B. We could also talk about the rate of change of rotation. In other words, the rate of change of the slope. You could have a gradually changing slope as in the green beam, or you could have a rapidly changing slope as in the black beam. So as usual, the problem is how do we put these in mathematical formulations and make predictions about how much deformation measured in delta or theta or the rate of change of the slope how do we put numbers to these and make predictions about how much moment produces how much deformation? In order to do this, and again, we're in the elastic range, so we have to say something about the elastic modulus. Something that is essentially a spring constant that tells you how much deformation results from a certain amount of stress in a given material. It basically shows you the relationship between stresses and change in shape. So that should be something that should be useful. Now, again, when we went through this, if you want to brush up on the elastic modulus, which is a relationship between stress and strain, you can look at the first video in the bending stress analysis and design series. So usually we have our stress on the vertical axis and the strain, which is a measure of deformation in the horizontal axis. And in the elastic range, we have a linear relationship between stress and strain represented here by the green line. And the purple part of the line represents when we go past the elastic range and there's no longer a linear relationship between stress and strain. So it follows the way we define our elastic modulus that stress divided by strain gives you the elastic modulus, which is the slope of the line. And we have slopes for steel, concrete, carbon, different materials. So it follows therefore from this equation that in order to get the strain, you have to divide the stresses by the elastic modulus of the material. And to define it in terms of lines and in terms of its actual definition, we say strain is equal to the change in length divided by the original length. So these two formulas for strain, we're going to keep up here because they're going to come in handy. 
So strain is the stress divided by the elastic modulus of the material, and it is defined as the change in length divided by the original length. Something else we'll have to talk about is angles, since we're going to be talking about rotations, right? And these angles are particularly small. So we're gonna to have to talk about small angles. There's certain unique properties of small angles, uh, certain approximations that we can make that come in handy when doing this kind of analysis. So, small angle approximations. Let's start by defining an angle. We have an angle here, d theta. D just means it's a small angle, differential angle. Uh, anywhere from zero to about five or 10 degrees. So, in order to define this angle, it has a radius and it has an arc that it sweeps through. Let's call that arc length S as we can see in the picture, and the radius is r. Now defining the angle in terms of radians, d theta is equal to s over r. By definition, d theta in radians is s over r. And just brushing this up. Now, we can draw the triangle associated with this angle, and uh, we know that the tangent of the angle is dy dx as shown, the opposite divided by the adjacent. Now, notice this, for a small angle, the arc length, S, swept by the radius to create the angle is approximately equal to the opposite of the angle, the opposite line, D, D, Y, right? So we can say that S, since uh, it's approximately equal to D, Y, we can replace S with D, Y. And the R is D, X in this case. So we can redefine our angle as the tangent of the angle, which is dy dx, because it is defined as s over r. s is essentially dy, and r is dx. Therefore, the angle is approximately equal to the tangent of the angle in radians. Okay. Third thing we have to bring up is how we measure this thing I talked about in the black beam a high rate of change of curvature, right? As opposed to a gradual change. So this concept of rate of change of curvature, how do we define that using the small angles and so on and so forth, right? So we take point A and point B, we cut out that little section, and we consider this to be a very, very small section, right? And it's just exaggerated here between A and B such that the length is dx, the differential x, a small infinitesimal length of the beam. At point A and point B, we do have an angle. dy dx at point A, dy dx at point B, right? And the rate of change of that angle can be written in these terms d theta dx, using concepts in calculus, differential calculus, basically. Since we're talking about small areas and rates of change, we're not surprised to see differential calculus. So, we can write this rate of change of rotation, which is called curvature. Rate of change of rotation or curvature is the second derivative of y. So just a quick recap here. All we have done so far is asked ourselves, what measurements can we make in order to demonstrate the deformation and the change of shape that a beam undergoes when it bends, right? So we talked about a vertical drop, right? At point A and point B, we can say there's a delta A and a delta B. We can talk about the rotation as well. We can say there's a theta A and there's a theta B. We also talk about the rate of change of rotation. Is it a gradual change in the slope, as in the green beam, or a more rapid change in the slope? And now we developed three pertinent mathematical objects. Or we, you know, we recalled to mind three pertinent mathematical objects being strain, small angle approximation, and curvature, the definition of this 
gradual or rapid change of slope we talked about, right? And armed with these three and a little bit of knowledge from our previous two lectures, we're going to develop the elastic curvature theory of beams. And without anything more than these three objects and a little bit of intuition. Back to the blue beam, the blue unbent beam and the red bent beam. Now, like in our first video, what we did was compare the difference between the shape of the blue beam and the red beam. And then we essentially discovered that bending caused compression and tension at different portions of the cross section of the beam. We're going to do something similar here. We're going to draw a vertical line at point A. We're going to show the delta A, the vertical drop, and the theta A, the rotation of the beam. And we're going to draw another vertical line to the right of A and consider that that line is an infinitesimal length away from A, but just exaggerated here. So we're going to enlarge here a portion of the blue beam, the length of which is dx, which is an infinitesimally small length, dx. And to do this comparison, we're going to superimpose a picture of the red beam. We can see here that essentially the blue beam, the length of the blue beam, which is a rectangle, has been transformed into a trapezoid by compression at the top and elongation at the bottom. So tensile stress and elongation at the bottom and a compressive stress and a shortening at the top, right? And this is how we represent in an ideal fashion, again, the difference between an infinitesimal small length of the blue beam and an infinitesimal length of the red beam. Now let's do some labeling here. We have C, which is the distance to the centroid, right? We have DX, which is the length. Now we're going to call the change in shape at the top at the bottom, the change in the length of the beam, DL at the top is DL at the bottom, either got shortened or got lengthened by the same amount. And the line through the middle, the dashed line, represents the centroidal axis and now if you want to the neutral axis I should say now you should go back to the first two videos in order to brush up on some of these concepts but we're just going to go back with this rather quickly now we know that within the elastic range we have a linear stress diagram of this manner right so and the stress which we figured out from our second video is equal to mc over i both our first video and our second video both arrived at this conclusion. Now, if we reach into our box of mathematical objects, first of all, we have strain is equal to the stress divided by the elastic modulus. So how do we write that? We have our stress is equal to MC over I, and if we have stress over strain, we essentially have MC over EI. Okay, now the second item in that box says that strain is equal to the length divided by the original length. Sorry, the change in length divided by the original length. So the change in length in our case here is dl, and the original length is dx. So we just write dl dx. Now we know from simple trigonometry, and you can easily confirm this, that dl is equal to c times the tangent of d theta, right? And we also know from our second box of mathematical objects that d theta in small angles is essentially equal to the tangent of theta. We replace the tangent of theta with d theta. So now we essentially have that strain is equal to c d theta dx, right? Now, if we equate in the first box those two definitions of strain, they must be equal, right? They define the same thing, that the stress over the st uh, elastic modulus is equal to the change in length divided by the original length, right? By definition, we will get here c d theta dx is equal to mc over i we can cancel out c on both sides of the equation right and we essentially then get d theta dx is equal to m over ei now if we look at our third box of mathematical objects we see that d theta dx is curvature is how we define the rate of change of slope of the beam right so we can essentially rewrite m over ei right as the second derivative of y considering y to be the vertical Right now, this is essentially what the elastic curvature of beam theory is. Time for a quick recap. What have we done? We said, how can we measure the change of shape in a beam when it undergoes bending? We came up with a vertical drop delta. We came up with a rotation theta. And we also came up with a rate of change of rotation that we called a curvature. And 
we defined a few mathematical logics that will be helpful along the way. Obviously, one would be the, the, the relationship between stress and deformation, the relationship between stress and strain, right? And we talked about the elastic modulus. We defined strain as stress divided by the elastic modulus. We talked about small angle approximations, and we defined curvature. And then we went ahead and compared the difference in the shape using an infinitesimal length dx of the blue beam and the red beam, right? We showed that the stress is equal to mc over i because we're in the elastic range, right? And now we went back and filled in our parameters, right, into the stress and the strain equation and defined curvature with help with the help of the small angle approximation. And we essentially arrived at the fact that curvature, this rate of change of slope, is equal to m over ei, and it is the right it is the second derivative of y when y is considered to be the vertical now therefore in order to get to the rotation theta you integrate once and in order to get to the vertical drop y or delta you integrate twice now all methods of beam deflection and rotation calculation be it moment area method conjugate beam method or the method of direct integrations all come from this concept that the curvature of the beam d theta dx is equal to m over ei which is also equal to the second derivative of y ladies and gentlemen once again i would like to thank you for taking your time to watch this video another session of prometheus university and if you enjoyed it please share it and keep your eye out for the next video, part four in our nine part series on bending stress analysis and design. And in this part, we'll be talking about the plastic section modulus, which describes the stress distribution beyond the elastic range. Thank you very much.